Next, a hearing on the costs and production schedule of the F-22 military airplane. A Pentagon official and the Deputy Air Force Undersecretary testified on Tuesday. Congressman Chris Shays of Connecticut chaired this hearing of the House Government Reform Subcommittee. It lasts two hours, 40 minutes. Morning, I'd like to call this hearing to order. Last February, in response to our request to describe high-risk programs in the Department of Defense, DOD, the General Accounting Office, GAO, testified that unrealistic cost, schedule, and performance estimates continue to plague major weapon systems acquisitions. JO pointed specifically to cost overruns in the program to design and build the next generation air superiority jet fighter, the F-22. In March, JO told Congress, it was unlikely the Air Force would be able to keep the F-22 engineering and manufacturing development, EMD program, within cost limits. They cited persistent EMD spending growth not addressed by control strategies and testing delays that could push cause cost higher still. At that time, DOD assured the subcommittee cost control continues to be a primary emphasis in the F-22 program and congressional mandated spending caps would not be exceeded. The department's top acquisition reform official described, quote, comprehensive measures to track and control F-22 program costs, end of quote. DOD promised close monitoring of Air Force efforts to cut $660 million in projected development expenses and $16 billion in estimated production spending from the $60 billion program. Nevertheless, defense authorization and appropriations bills this year reflected growing congressional unease over the price and pace of the F-22 program. A commitment to F-22 production was delayed and made contingent on sufficient pre-production testing and completion of delayed avionics development. So today, on the 58th anniversary of the bombing of Pearl Harbor, we revisit the issues of F-22 cost control and development delays, asking how spending control strategies are being implemented and how program managers are meeting leaner budgets and tighter schedules. We do so in pursuit of our broad oversight mission to monitor programs identified as vulnerable to waste and mismanagement. This hearing affords the subcommittee and DOD an opportunity to assess the progress and the problems of a major acquisition effort hailed by some as a model of advanced technical development, but scorned by others as vintage wasteful Cold War pr procurement of s out of sync with post-Cold War national security needs. In order to focus on current F-22 cost controls, we invited only Defense Department witnesses to testify today. At the subcommittee's request, GAO, GAO will, will provide testimony in specific aspects of F-22 production cost savings at a future hearing. I want to acknowledge the work of our subcommittee colleague from Massachusetts, Congressman John Tierney, uh, who is on my right, who has been dedicated and articulate in expressing his concerns over F-22 costs and who has been a full partner in our oversight of DOD acquisition reforms. The future of U.S. air power will be shaped by our past. I'd like to... Um, say that uh, before we start this hearing, I'd like a few moments of silence in remembrance for the 2,403 Americans and their precious families who lost their lives 58 years ago today at Pearl Harbor. Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Thank you for calling this hearing and following up on this issue. Let me welcome also our witnesses here this morning. I also want to thank the General Accounting Office for providing an official statement for the record. The Department of Defense currently is operating three aircraft development programs that some have projected to cost more than $350 billion. Many experts seem to agree that the Pentagon cannot afford all three of these programs under any reasonable potential scenario. As a result, experts from all sides have raised questions with each of these programs, such as the necessity and relevance of each program in today's post-Cold War environment, the ability of each aircraft to operate between and among the various services, the continued viability of strategic uses for these aircraft, and of course, the cost of each program. In addition to focusing on the continued increases in cost for development and production of the F-22, this hearing is also directed toward analyzing the measures utilized by the Air Force in the Department of Defense to predict and control these costs. Although I understand the Air Force has achieved some of its performance goals for the F-22, it appears from the written statement by the General Accounting Office that program costs are continuing to rise despite the implementation of cost control measures. The broad question raised is whether the Air Force should be more realistic in terms of anticipating delays in construction in subcontractor performance and in software development. Looking at the record of the past 10 years, it appears that the Air Force has consistently underestimated the length of delays and increases in costs. At some point, repeated upward adjustments cease to be unexpected. At some point, they reveal a strategy that is overly optimistic. As with any prioritization analysis, cost concerns with the F-22 program must inform the larger questions such as the relevance of the F-22 program in light of other ongoing aircraft development programs. Essentially, as the cost for the F-22 program continue to increase, the value of each aircraft decreases compared to other alternatives. For these reasons, I look forward to hearing from both of our witnesses about measures they are taking to predict more accurately the future cost increases, as well as measures being implemented to reduce current cost estimates. Once again, I thank the witnesses for being here, and you, Mr. Chairman, for conducting this hearing. First, before swearing in our witnesses, we just have a little housekeeping. I ask unanimous consent that all members of the subcommittee be permitted to place any opening statement in the record and that the record remain open for three days for that purpose, without objection so ordered. I ask further unanimous consent that all witnesses be permitted to include their written statement in the record and without objection so ordered. And I ask further unanimous consent that written statements submitted by the General Accounting Office, by Representative Bob Barr of Georgia, and by Representative Saxby Chambliss of Georgia be printed in the hearing record and without objection so ordered. Um, at this time, uh, I'll call our witnesses. Uh, Dr. George Schneider, Director of Strategic and Tactical Systems, Department of Defense. And then uh, Darlene Druin, Druin, I'm sorry. Uh, Deputy Air Force Undersecretary, United States Air Force Department of Defense. If I could, uh, I would invite both witnesses to stand up. As you know, we swear all our witnesses and even members of Congress who testified before the committee. If you raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony we'll give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Note for the record that both our witnesses have responded in the affirmative. Um, Mr. Dr. Schneider, I think you're going first. Yes, sir. And my understanding is that you have a shorter testimony. Um, I'm going to put the, the, the uh, clock on for five minutes, but you just go on. I'll just turn it over again. And I understand, um, Mr. Druin, that, Druin you, that your statement will be about 20 minutes, which we're, we're happy to have you put on the record and to, to listen to. And so we will... Um, um, uh, Mr. Chambliss? You're more than welcome to be up here if you would like. We're happy to have you. Okay. Um, and that we will um, uh, allow you to speak for the 20 minutes. After 20 minutes, we'll give you a warning. And we'll just note for uh, the record that uh, Mr. Chambliss is here, and it's nice to have you here. Thank you for coming. Um, Dr. Snyder, thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to discuss today the Department of Defense's efforts to control the costs and adhere to the schedule of the F-22 aircraft program. I will just comment on a few things that are from my written statement, which will uh, go into the record, as you said earlier. F-22 is a technically challenging program. Uh, the F-22 is, is intended to have unprecedented capabilities 
in the areas of low observability, the ability to fly supersonically without afterburner, and advanced avionics and sensors. It's intended to ensure that our Air Forces remain dominant in the 21st century. Such a program naturally gives us challenges regarding cost and schedule performance. We have several oversight and budgeting processes within the department that we use to address such challenges, and I'll summarize the principal ones of these. These tools are intended to provide the Secretary of Defense and his staff the information that he and they need to monitor, control, and reduce costs and maintain program schedules. The first process I would mention is where all programs begin, is with the requirements process. The senior military leadership on the Joint Requirements Oversight Council address cost and schedule in establishing the military justification for an acquisition program. This Joint Requirements Oversight Council, which is chaired by the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and includes the Military Service Vice Chiefs, focuses on ensuring that programs are affordable and can be fielded in a timely manner. They now require that cost be a required parameter among the formal requirements for weapon systems. So that's the requirements process. The second has to do with the acquisition process, and in particular, the Defense Acquisition Board. This is chaired by the Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition Technology and Logistics, my boss, Dr. Gansler. It includes other senior officials in the Office of the Secretary of Defense, and the Vice Chairman of the Defense Acquisition Board is the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who also chairs the Joint Requirements Oversight Council. So we have his participation from a requirements point of view in this acquisition forum. The Defense Acquisition Board, or the DAB, as we call it, meets before major transition points or milestones as a program progresses through each phase of development and production. Cost and schedule considerations are a major focus at a DAB review, and different offices within the department bring material to be considered at those meetings. Foremost among these in the cost area is the Office of the Secretary of Defense's Cost Analysis Improvement Group. They provide an independent cost estimate. By independent, we mean it's independent of the military service, uh, it's independent of the program office. This ensures that senior officials receive the most candid and complete information about the cost of weapons acquisition programs. We also conduct, as part of such milestone reviews, an affordability analysis, which looks at the cost of the program in the context of the overall budget, and particularly the mission area uh, for that program. So that's the DAB process, which is geared to milestones in a program. A third process is a more routine process of review of programs. Uh, this is the Def Defense Acquisition Executive Summary process. And this, on a quarterly basis, highlights to the Undersecretary the cost, schedule, technical performance, management, and other key parameters of major defense acquisition programs. It includes examining what's called an earned value management system, which is a way of tracking cost and schedule according to the plan to complete distinct packets of work. And uh, Mrs. Druyan will show you some examples of, of uh, such tracking information. 
The fourth department review is our review of the adequacy of the overall defense program in what we call the planning, programming, and budgeting system. This is the system whereby we prepare the annual budget which we bring uh, to the Congress each year. And this is not just for one year, but includes the future year's defense program of five or six years. Initial proposals for this budget come to us from the military departments. We then evaluate those in our summer program review. And finally, the Defense Resources Board, which the Deputy Secretary of Defense chairs, considers alternative approaches that might provide improved overall effectiveness within the available funds. These reviews consider the balance among force structure, modernization, such as the F-22, readiness and sustainability, and seek to accomplish the established policy goals within the available funds. The Department's tactical aircraft programs are often included in detail in these reviews. These are all parts of the Department's internal process. We also report to Congress on program costs, and annually we send over the selected acquisition report, which provides cost schedule and other information about our major programs. Dr. Gansler also holds program reviews more often than the processes I just described for high priority programs. F-22 falls in this category and in fact he has a review of the F-22 scheduled for this coming Thursday, two, two days from now. When Dr. Gansler decided in December 1998, a year ago, to approve the go-ahead for two aircraft, he reiterated the importance of maintaining continued emphasis on the F-22 program within the congressional cost caps. He challenged the Air Force and its contractors to continue efforts to reduce costs. And he directed the Air Force to provide him with quarterly briefings on development and production cost status. In this manner, he's been able to track cost and schedule variances, the cost of each development aircraft being produced compared to the projected cost, and the status of individual cost reduction plans for both development and production. To date, trends in cost and schedule have shown some improvement, but I think it's fair to say the jury is still out on the ability of these reduction plans to produce all the cost savings we need to stay within the caps. Continuation of these quarterly reviews will give us added confidence that the decision makers have the best information at each milestone decision on the ability of the service to execute the F-22 program as planned. Uh, Mr. Chairman, those are the points I wanted to highlight. And um, I'll be happy to respond to any questions you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Druyan. Am I pronouncing your name correctly? It's uh, Druyan, yes. Thank you. Okay. You're going to be given 20 minutes, and we'll let you know uh, after that if uh, we need to cut you shorter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To uh, try to explain the F-22 program and give you a better understanding of the management and cost oversight that we have in this program, I have prepared a series of charts. Um, <clears throat> I have um, laid out in front of you an outline that I'm going to basically follow, and I'm going to basically skip that to really get into the meat of the material. The first issue I wanted to just very briefly cover is the issue of why do we need the F-22. The F-22 provides air dominance over the battlefield. It is optimized for the air-to-air -air environment. Today, uh, the F-22 is scheduled to replace the F-15, which is not able to operate in an advanced surface-to-air missile environment. 
The F-15 is at rough parity today with the Su-27 and the MiG-29 fighter aircrafts. The F-22's attributes of stealth, super cruise, maneuverability, and integrated avionics are absolutely essential for enabling uh, dominance over the battlefield. And more importantly, the F-22 complements the Joint Strike Fighter, which is optimized for ground attack. And looking at uh, the next chart, and looking at the current EMD cost estimate, I have broken this up into the airframe, the engine, and other government costs. The total cap that we have today on the development program is $18.9 billion. And what I would like to do is to peel that back further so you can understand how we are carefully managing this program to stay within the development cost cap established by the Congress back in 1998. My next chart uh, basically lays out a cost track history, which I think is important for this committee to understand. When the original airframe development contract was awarded back in 1992, the original value was approximately $10.3 billion. Today, our, our current um, estimate to complete this program is $14.3 billion. I think it's important for this committee to understand what has caused the cost growths within this program. As you can see, I have three columns where I basically have laid out the various growths that we have experienced. The first column is called rephase, and, and this was driven by um, changes uh, made both within the defense budget as well as within the congressional budgets that, in essence, uh, stretched the program out. Uh, a total of $803 million was removed from the program, which drove an overall cost increase in the range of about almost 15%. The actual cost growth experienced by the contractor in which we are projecting through the completion of development is in the range of approximately 18.7 percent. The last column entitled Other is basically the work scope changes that um, have been laid into this program since its inception. In turning to the development uh, engine contract, you will see that I have laid it out in a similar fashion. Original contract value was approximately $1.5 billion. Today, our estimate to complete that program is at roughly $2.4 billion. You can see that the rephases caused by program uh, funding instability through the congressional and defense budget cycles caused a growth of approximately 23 percent. And the contractor experienced an actual growth in the range of approximately 33 percent. I would tell you that half of this uh, cost growth experienced by the contractor was in the hot turbine section uh, redesign that we entered into back in 1994 because this was a durability issue. We basically viewed it as pay me now or pay me later. And for long-term operation and support costs, it made much greater sense to go back and to redesign that hot turbine section so that it would have the durability for the uh, life of the engine. My next chart uh, deals with F-22 uh, EMD costs. And, and uh, back in March of uh, 1999, in front of the SASC uh, tactical air uh, hearing, I basically reported that uh, our worst case analysis in terms of cost growth above the congressionally imposed development ceiling was about $660 million. I also reported at that time that we had laid in, uh, in a number of initiatives to vigorously manage this program and to offset those potential cost growths. Back in March of 99, I reported we had offsets dollar for dollar for the potential cost growth. Today, I'm able to report to this committee that we have identified an additional $200 million for now a total of $860 million worth of offsets to um, handle this worst-case shortfall that we predicted back in March of 99. And what I would like to highlight for you are the two areas that um, have helped to basically uh, build on our confidence and to build uh, a larger offset. The first one is, and it's the next chart, called Development Cost Reduction Status. Back in March of 99, I reviewed with the uh, SASC 
uh, tactical air hearing, a process that we had laid in place in July of 1998 to rigorously control costs. And basically, what we have laid in place, as you could see in 99, I was predicting cost reduction savings uh, from a, a variety of projects, uh, such as uh, revamping uh, processes to eliminate uh, overhead, um, reusing EMD assets as opposed to having new assets built, uh, some new technical approaches such as uh, GPS. We reported um, about $80 million in offsets. Today that number, as you can see in September of 99, has grown to approximately $154 million. I have approximately 70 projects that we carefully track, and the um, offset column, which is about 79 percent today, we are very, very confident of, and it is actually built into our development e estimate. The next chart uh, tracks some of the metrics that we use on a monthly basis, and, and I would tell you that um, within the Air Force, uh, for example, I conduct what we call a, MER, a MER, a monthly executive review, a very detailed review with uh, the contractor team and with our program office, and I basically drill down into multiple levels of metrics to understand exactly where we are in terms of cost, in terms of schedule and, and in terms of meeting the technical requirements uh, in the program. And what this chart basically shows you is um, through the completion of development, we basically have laid out uh, a, a curve where we um, are actively managing to in terms of cost and schedule. And you would see in tracking that all the way back to August of um, 1998, to where I am today in terms of my schedule variance, my schedule variance continues to improve. And that is very, very positive. Um, we are seeing a cost variance of running around five and a half, six million dollars a month. And you would note that between September and October, I had a bump up in costs of about eleven million dollars. The majority of that bump up in cost was tied in with a union settlement at the uh, Boeing Seattle facility with both their commercial and military work. And basically, that represents a one-time charge in which they paid all of their employees a bonus. And so that, that's why you basically see that um, bump up in, in, in the cost arena. This is something that uh, we watch very, very closely. And as I explained to you, sir, we drill down into it to really understand what is driving these costs and what we need to do to make sure they remain contained. My next chart is called EMD Equivalent Headcount, and I refer to this basically as our slim fast plan. As we complete each portion of the development program, it is very important that we get rid of um, personnel associated with the program. They have to be offloaded from the program as their work is completed. We cannot afford to carry them along. And what we have done in this program, this is a, a, an additional set of metrics that we have laid in place. We basically have laid through the entire program where we need to be to uh, ensure that we remain within the, the um, cost cap for development. And as you can see, this is a good example, Lockheed Martin, Fort Worth. Uh, basically, we're tracking right along where we should be in terms of the equivalent headcount to stay within the cost cap. Um, I think another good news story is that overtime used to run as high as 11 percent. Uh, today that's running in the neighborhood of 5 to 6 percent, and there's been very specific guidance and controls laid in place to control overtime and only use it when you absolutely need to use it to be able to meet um, key schedule commitments. The next chart is entitled Production Cost Estimate. Today, our um, cost cap and our production program estimate um, is $39.8 billion. And what I have done is to break this off for you between Lockheed Martin and Pratt and & Whitney and to track it back to the original joint estimate team that was put together in 1996-97 timeframe to show you the changes in profile and quantities of airplanes we're buying through the QDR. And then I'm going to specifically address this, the cost reduction initiatives 
that were laid in place and that we have been very actively tracking um, along uh, since uh, completion of the jet. And if you would turn to the next chart, it's titled Production Cost Reduction Plan Savings. When we concluded the jet in June of 97, we had identified approximately $9 billion, almost $10 billion worth of production cost reduction initiatives that were being laid in place. As you can see, since June of 97 to where we are today, my, my um, data shows through July of 99, that number has climbed to $16.9 billion. Mr. Chairman, I would tell you that we have identified um, every project. We are tracking every project. We're folding them into our baseline as they become reality. And I think it's important to point out that the, if you turn back to the production cost estimate uh, on the previous chart, identified $15.1 billion worth of initiatives that we needed to lay in place. And as you can see, I am basically tracking to $16.9 billion worth of initiatives. And if I could give you uh, an, an example uh, of what some of these cost reduction initiatives are, um, as we go th um, through looking at um, various aspects of the program, uh, contractors are able to, for example, in the area of material efficiency, by rolling the material up into larger quantities and using the leveraging power of the Lockheed Martin Corporation and the Boeing Corporation, they roll it into much larger buys, for example, uh, buys of material that would be needed uh, to make, for example, commercial aircraft. And we're able to obviously garner much larger savings when you can go out with a much larger buy of material. Um, that is just uh, one of um, you know, many, many examples. And the engine itself, um, back in the June of 97 time frame, we identified approximately $3.2 billion worth of cost reduction initiatives that uh, Pratt was uh, laying very aggressively into the program. Today, that number is approximately $4.1 billion. And once again, I would remind you that the offsets needed to keep this program and the engine side uh, on track was approximately $2.5 billion. So we have um, obviously a lot of initiatives uh, built in there that will ensure that we make that um, requirement. And I want to give you an example of uh, one specific um, initiative, and it's the hollow fan blade. This is something that is built by uh, Pratt & Whitney. Uh, and this is a, a key technology that Pratt also needs to merge into its commercial engine program as well. And we laid out a plan uh, about uh, three years ago to turn the hollow fan blade into reality and actually incorporate it into this program. And it is tracking to plan. The cost of the hollow fan blade has been reduced approximately uh, threefold. And when I look at the average savings per aircraft engine, when we actually incorporate the hollow fan blade, it's approximately $185,000 savings per engine. The next chart really gives you the, the, the big picture of what we're doing to manage the production costs. When we concluded the joint estimate team back in the 1997 time frame, we felt it was very important that we lay in uh, some target price commitment curves into the development contract to really have the contractors focus in and make the right investments up front to ensure that we could deliver an airplane at 84.7 million flyaway unit cost. And I would tell you for the first contract that we have written, the PRTV contract that was a firm fixed price contract, I track that very, very closely. And we expect that uh, the original estimate we had for this program in terms of assembly hours, for example, that it's going to uh, do better than what we had projected. We are also uh, tracking the same data for the production representative test vehicle two effort, which will be six aircraft that will be put on contract later this, this month. Uh, we have tied this into a target price commitment curve. And basically, the contractors have made upfront investments, not government investments, but upfront investments from their own corporate funds 
to ensure that we can stay within the uh, target price of this program. And if they are able to stay within the target price curve that we have laid out here, they not only recoup their investments, but they also make a return in their investment. And, and uh, this is contractually laid out uh, within the development contract and will be carried out as, um, and executed as uh, we move through this program. Next, I'd like to talk about avionics software for a moment. When I testified at the SASC uh, TAC air hearing on 17 March 1999, we had delivered at that time the two top blocks, block zero and block 1.0 in terms of avionics software. Avionics software has always been viewed as the high risk portion of this program. And I am very pleased to report to this committee the tremendous progress that we are making in this arena. As you can see, we have already delivered down through block two and the block that is colored green that says five months early that was projected to be delivered on 15 January 2000, in fact was delivered one month early, it was delivered last Friday and it, and it is today in aircraft number 4004 on the development line. We consider this to be just an extremely good news story. If I were to show you some of the metrics, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think you would be amazed that we track for each one of these blocks. And my latest review of the met metrics, and I look at them every single month, shows that for block 23S and for block 3, as well as block 3.1, we are on schedule and, in fact, are ahead of schedule which is why we are now able to accelerate the full sensor fusion portion of the software six and a half months early. Um, and we're now projecting to deliver that to the aircraft uh, the 30th of October, 2000. I asked the Software Engineering Institute of Carnegie Mellon University, we uh, asked them to go in and do an in-depth review of how well we are doing in the whole software arena in, in the avionics. And uh, I would tell you that uh, the Software Institute gave us very high, high marks. In fact, uh, they call what we're doing within the F-22 program as best practices, a pioneer within the Air Force, that we have outstanding tools, outstanding metrics, a very solid architecture, and the bottom line is that I believe that we will be able to meet the schedule that we have clearly laid out here. Um, it is a, a, a schedule that is a very reasonable risk based on what we have seen to date. And I would tell you, Mr. Chairman, that uh, with the uh, delivery of uh, Block 1.2 and Block 2, that represents 50% of the uh, software that needs to be delivered. And each of that has been delivered as we had predicted or actually a little bit ahead of schedule. The next chart talks about software quality metrics, which is a very important metric that uh, I monitor on a monthly basis. This chart shows you the software errors found per 1,000 lines of code, and it shows you what the industry standard is, and it's basically five and a half errors per 1,000 lines of code, and it shows you what we are actually tracking within block one and block two. We are well below the industry sta standard, which is good news. And I would tell you for block 2S and block three, you would see similar types of data. Now I'd like to turn to F-22 testing for a moment. And I have to take you back in history to uh, the original development program at its inception. This program was designed to change the paradigm of how we do testing. This program has employed modeling and simulation uh, unlike any other fighter aircraft in, in the history of the Defense Department. We have used a philosophy to test at the lowest subcomponent, then at the component, work it up to the subsystem, and then to the system level. As you can see, we have uh, this chart lists the, the amount of testing that we have accomplished to date, over 45,000 hours of wind tunnel testing, over 60,000 hours of subsystem laboratory testing, over 10,000 hours of radar testing, 14 live fire tests on aircraft components. Today, our flight test hours and our two um, uh, development aircraft uh, are 
around 480 hours. Actually, that number changes every day. And by December of 2000, we predict that we will have over 1,000 flight test hours underneath our belt. And I believe it's very important that I point out to you that we have seen much uh, efficiency in how we do our sorties. We had planned for uh, uh, each of our sorties to take approximately 1.8 hours. We're actually able to achieve 2.4 hours, which represents a 25% increase in productivity. And we have basically replanned uh, parts of the test program to make up for time that we had lost. The climatic uh, test chamber is a good, ex a good example of where we were able to recapture uh, much of the uh, test time that we had originally laid out in the program. And turning to the next chart, looking at full-scale static testing, the primary purpose of full-scale uh, static uh, testing is to support the certification of the full F-22 operating envelope. This test is conducted in two phases. We call it the limit phase and the post-limit phase. We have completed the limit load testing uh, as of uh, September of 99 successfully. And this test demonstrated that there is no permanent structural damage at the max loads level expected uh, during the life of this aircraft. We entered the post-limit loads testing on the 2nd of December. Uh, this um, test will basically uh, demonstrate the, the strength up to one and a half times the maximum load levels expected during the life of this uh, aircraft. Today, I'm at um, 1.2 times the max load level. And uh, in talking to our structural engineers, we're following a very, very deliberate uh, program, uh, validating uh, our analysis tools as we move to, the, to uh, complete this test before the LRIP decision. I would also point out that almost 29% of our test points have been completed for the flying qualities on this aircraft. A question we're often asked is, uh, my next chart is, can we afford all of this? And what I have laid out for you is what I call our sand chart. This is the average United States Air Force aircraft RDT&E and procurement investment over a 30-year history. As you can see, the historic norm um, for this history runs about 16% of our Air Force TOA. And if you see where we are with respect to our President's budget, I am well below that historic norm. In fact, I'm in the range of, of, of 11 to 12%. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, I would like to reiterate to you that F-22 development and production costs are very carefully managed. And I can continue to report today that they are within the congressional cost caps. This is a very tough program to manage. I think that I have the best team within the Air Force and within the, within the contractor community aggressively working this program. Our avionics is very much on track, and all blocks are meeting or exceeding the jet delivery dates. The F-22 has completed our planned flight test activities. For this phase of the program, we had laid out approximately 480 to 500 hours, and we will complete that by the end of uh, this month. And the F-22 program, as you can see, is affordable uh, if you look at the total obligation authority and look at what the historic norms have been. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to responding to your questions. Thank you very much for your comprehensive testimony. Um, I'm going to start um, the question by just making a quick statement, but first I want to recognize that we have um, not only Mr. Saxby Chambliss, who's going to participate in the hearing, he doesn't serve on this committee, but he serves on the Armed Services Committee. Uh, and we welcome him and happy to have him here. And we also have uh, John Micah, who uh, chairs, uh, serves on the Government Reform Committee, serves on this committee, and also is the chairman of the Government Reform Subcommittee on Criminal Justice, Drug Policy, and Human Resources. And I would also point out that Mr. Chambliss is the leader's representative on the Budget Committee. Um, 
I take a general assumption that our job in Congress is to make sure that our military are never involved in a fair fight. In other words, we always have superior uh, equipment uh, uh, that, um, that in every instance um, the training is better and so that when we ask our men and women to risk their lives that they, that they in fact um, have all the advantages possible. So um, I have less concern about the uh, concept of the F-22 than, than the general recognition that um, because we need it uh, and the manufacturing of the Air Force know we need it, uh, there isn't the competition that says, well, um, someone else is going to replace us. It's really the only show in town. At least that's the way it strikes me. And what I've, um, and I would also say that I've always appreciated the Air Force's cooperation with this committee and, and DOD in general. So um, we have a, a good relationship. But this is a program, since there isn't the competition, that Congress needs to do a better job of oversight and uh, put people's uh, feet to the fire. Um, I would ask, ask you, Mr. Schneider, first that uh, you gave a whole host of of uh, your presentation was solely based on the various groups that were involved in, in um, uh, helping to control costs. And I, I was struck by the fact that, that uh, there were so many that it, I began to wonder who ultimately holds the accountability. And I began to wonder what kind of coordination exists between, uh, among these various groups. So maybe you could respond to that. The accountability for the acquisition programs rests with the Undersecretary for Acquisition Technology and Logistics, Dr. Gansler. Uh, he participates in all of those activities that I mentioned, with the exception of the Joint Requirements Oversight Council, which is the purview of, of the military and the Joint Staff. Uh, Many of the same participants are in all of those activities, but the activities do different things. The Defense Acquisition Board process deals with milestones. Is a program ready to go into engineering and manufacturing development? Is it ready for production? So typically, uh, the Defense Acquisition Board will meet uh, every um, few years or so on a program. Uh, the process that I described after that involves many of the same people, but it's a more routine process that occurs uh, every three months in whether or not a program is about to come to a milestone. We examine how well it's doing. So. And then the third thing I described in, in that nature is the annual budget process. Again, uh, Dr. Gansler very much participates in that process. Uh, ultimately, the secretary and the deputy secretary are the decision makers with regard to that. Mr. Drunyan, um why were EMD aircraft flight dates delayed again due to wing manufacturing problems in June 1999, three months after DOD testified that the problems had been solved? If you were to look, sir, at the uh, approved uh, DAB schedule that we had in terms of uh, the performance of this uh, program, and the baseline that we're following is the baseline that was set out in December of 98. Um, we have been meeting all of the revised wing delivery schedules. Um, they have been delivered on time since um, we were able to basically solve that problem. Uh, they are all coming in on time with the exception of, uh, I believe it's the last one. This is an issue where Boeing overdrilled some holes, and so there's going to have to be some um, repairs done to those holes that they overdrilled. But the fact remains, our data will show you that we are tracking to the um, revised delivery schedule for both uh, for for all of the wings. 
So your point is that there is not a problem with the laser? My point, sir, is there was a problem. This okay. problem was worked very aggressively, and this problem has been solved, and we're tracking it on a monthly basis to ensure that those wings are delivered to the schedule that we have in place today, and they, in fact, are being delivered to that schedule in place today. That was a problem that we had approximately two years ago. That was, and, and as I said, a problem very See, let, me just, let me just more. interrupt you a second. I'm, there are so many revisions, or there appear to be so many yes. revisions, that I, I, I'm wondering which revision am I at. Um, it's the current let baseline me, Let me just program. stop you a second. In June, we were told um, that the problems had been solved. Were the problems solved when we were told they were solved, or were there a new problems that existed afterwards? The um, schedule that I'm referring to is the approved um, baseline schedule. Dated when? Um, this is uh, 1998. When? And, um, when in 1998? I, I'd have to get that for the record, sir. Uh, I, I would say um, sometime in mid-98, but I will officially supply that for the record. The problems that we had with um, the wings itself um, were solved. Um, we actually it had to do with titanium castings, for example. Let me just be clear, though. Is the information I have that in June uh, the, we were said the problem was solved, and then are you saying you kept on the schedule of the 1998 schedule, or did we have a new schedule that occurred after that? The, um, Master Schedule 24 is what I'm basically referring to, and we laid in a plan for um, late wing delivery, uh, as well as a plan for boom repair, and we are basically tracking to that plan in terms of wing deliveries. I think there's been a lot of confusion in, in this subject, sir. We had a problem with uh, our ability to manufacture these wings. It was a problem that was very aggressively worked. And, and once they were able to demonstrate that they had a fix laid in place, we have since tracked them to ensure that those wings are being delivered in time. It's a very dynamic program. You know, it's a living, breathing program, and as you encounter problems, you work them, and then you lay in a schedule to track them to no, it. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have any question that it's extraordinarily dynamic. I, I just... I want us to make sure that when we're hearing that we're on schedule, we know which schedule we're on and when the schedule has been revised and how many times we've revised the schedule so that we've actually ended up meeting it. Um, let me just ask another question as it relates to this. Um, if you are being forced to delay flight tests and aircraft production, why are long-range goals also not being pushed back? I'm not sure I follow your question, sir. Well, particularly as it relates to avionics. I mean, we have a tremendous delay there. Um, and so you've revised your schedule on the short run. But um, we, uh, we're being told we're going to meet all the, the, the scheduled production in the future. So I'm, I'm, it would seem to me if you revise in the beginning, everything has to be revised. So you seem to be pushing everything up, and it seems to us, into an unrealistic uh, uh, limited time. If you look at where we are in terms of the uh, build of the uh, aircraft themselves, uh, aircraft uh, 4003, and this has been a schedule that I have been tracking since um, of uh, March of uh, 99, very, very carefully. Aircraft 4003 is scheduled to be delivered uh, February 16th of the year 2000. 4004 is scheduled to be delivered um, May of 2000. Uh, aircrafts 4005 and 4006 um, were scheduled to be delivered in, in June, late June of uh, 2000 and August of uh, 2000. Um, and there I am tracking, and this is an Excuse issue. Excuse me, this is, this is your revised schedule of yes. June, not yes. the master schedule. 
Uh, no, this is the master schedule, and it's, it's been in effect since March of 99, and that's the schedule that I am tracking to. Okay. So it was revised when? Our schedule, sir, is adjusted on an annual basis to accommodate where we are in the program. For example, as we have um, received um, earlier delivery of some of the avionics well, blocks. My, my time is running out. I mean, we're going to have plenty of time to talk about this. But let me just ask you, the avionics is behind schedule by how much? The avionics is um, to the schedule that we are tracking. It is not behind schedule. It is actually meeting or ahead of schedule. Based, and, on, and, based and, on which revision? Well. And that's an excellent question, sir. If I took you back to the joint est estimation team back in the 1997 time frame, uh, when I look at uh, where I am with block two and block three, I am going to deliver ahead of the 97 schedule. Mm -hmm. In fact, that one chart that I showed you in my presentation to you shows that uh, we have been able to draw in that schedule because we have such outstanding tools and, and uh, personnel working on the program that we're actually able to finish the coding and the integration and the sensor fusion sooner than we thought. That is really a good news story. Okay. And I can understand your confusion because I have no, had no, no, the same it, confusion. It, it, right. Well, there's going to be a lot of confusion, but we have lots of time to sort it out. There are going to be good stories here and there are going to be bad stories. And it's helpful for you not to just make me want to hear the good story because eventually the bad stories come out. It's better to have it all come out now, and we know. But this is the first, this is the first of a, a, a few hearings that this committee will have. And we just want the broad picture. Um, but my sense is that we have not gotten, uh, we ha are behind in our testing, and that is pushing, it would strike me that it would push back other elements to your whole program. But let me uh, call on Mr. Tierney, and we'll come back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Given the fact that uh, Congress removed about $500 million from the fiscal year 2000 uh, budget request, uh, which was uh, originally about $3 billion, can you tell us uh, whether or not the Air Force intends to make up that shortfall in some way? Uh, what Congress uh, did in the FYO um, budget that was passed and signed into law was to require us to incrementally fund <coughs> the PRTV-2 aircraft buy of six aircraft. And um, in terms of incrementally funding it, we are laying into our, our budget today, and obviously our budget is not complete within the department, but we are laying in the funds for fiscal year 01 and fiscal year 02 to finish incrementally funding uh, those six aircraft. So am I interpreting correctly say that you're increasing your funding request over the next two years? Yes, and you should see that uh, hopefully in the budget submission when it comes over the end of January, first part of February. Now, there was some suggestion in yesterday's uh, edition of the Defense News that the Air Force is leaning toward delaying the purchase of C-130J transports to make up the, tra the shortfall. Uh, are you considering that option? or? Um, sir, that's an, an issue that is uh, very much uh, under review today uh, within our, our budget. There has not been any final decisions made. I don't expect any final decisions, and that will be made until the budget is closed out. What other program sources are you considering to make up that shortfall? Um, well, C-130J was, was never a, a was not really laid in this soon in our budget, so we're not taking from the C-130J to pay for the F-22. And uh, in nowhere do you project that you're going to consider doing that at all? To use the C-130J, which was not in the 2001 budget we sent over last year to pay for the F-22? Well, to, to delay the purchase of the C-130Js. Um, that's a subject that is very much under review today. So you are considering this, delaying the C-130 jobs? Well, if you had looked at the budget that we submitted last year, um, I believe you, we really did not start buying those aircraft, I believe, until around the year 2003. But, but that is all under deliberation and will be um, vented um, through the um, budget process and will conclude by the end of December. Well, I think GAO estimated that if the C-130J's purchases ceased, 
then overhead costs for the F-22 that Lockheed Martin also makes at their facility would increase as much as 150 to 160 million dollars per year. Is that correct? Um, that's an, an area that uh, I have personally gone down twice to uh, review at the uh, Marietta facility. Um, as I recall, I did not see any an immediate impact to the OO budget. Um, potentially, we could see some cost growth in that arena. I would tell you that Lockheed is very aggressively managing that and looking at some alternative plans um, to see how we could um, manage uh, the issue of uh, any increase in overhead rates. But the fact of that it still remains that it may increase their overhead rate and that may increase the cost 150 to 160 million? Um, I don't think my numbers were that high. How high were well, your my, numbers? My, well, I, I do not uh, recall. Uh, I can supply that for the record if you would like. I, but, I would like but that. I believe my number was lower. And the fact that there was going to be a number of management actions laid in on, on the part of um, Lockheed, uh, it is hard to predict. Um, because of their aggressive management, what that number would finally look like. We can do some estimates, and that's what we tried to do. And so we're going to assume that their promises of aggressive management are going to save money and, and just factor in that savings? Is that the way this is going? Um, I think that that is a part of the equation that Lockheed is dealing with. Now, historically, it seems that whenever we have cost increases, uh, they're significantly higher than what we're now estimating. Why don't we use the historical models to determine the future cost and what the increases are going to be? Well, if, uh, if you look at the various cost estimating methodologies that are available to us, they basically are based on history, kind of looking in your rear view mirror, so to speak. Um, if you look at initiatives started by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, such as lean aircraft initiatives, um, there is a obviously some new paradigms to be laid in there as to how you can, for example, I'll use the F-16 as a real live example. We had a multi-year procurement that was 180 airplanes a year delivery to the United States Air Force. We broke that multi-year procurement around the year 1990-1991 and our number of aircraft, as I recall, dropped down around a, a quantity of 12 a year. Now, if you had used traditional estimating models, it would have told you that the price of those airplanes would have gone up, when in fact, that did not occur. So there are many, uh, when, you, when you look at uh, CAD CAM, computer-aided design, computer-aided manufacturing, robotics, um, and, and really leaning out your uh, production line, it will have a dramatic impact on the cost of whatever it is that you are building. And we have been able to demonstrate that um, in terms of when you look at travel time and, and an assembly line, when you relay it out, you can reduce costs significantly. And your cost models today do not have that type of data in them. They are continually being updated as we acquire that type of data. Well, historically in this program, uh, we've underestimated what the costs are going to be. But now you're telling me that looking forward, we're going to use these models and we're going to have a more optimistic view? Is that no, what I'm telling you is that I have production cost reduction initiatives laid in place. If I could give you an example, the Weapon Bay Door Project, this is a, what we call a lean aircraft initiative. It's one of our pro production cost reduction initiatives. We've been able to actually realize operator distance travel has been reduced by 76%. Parts distance travel reduced by 52%. Direct touch labor reduced by 44%. And throughput time reduced by 58%. When you take lean aircraft initiatives and go through your whole production cycle, you really look at what am I doing today and what do I need to do differently to reduce travel time, to reduce touch labor, and to significantly reduce throughput time. And, and those are the types of activities that are ongoing today, not only in F-22, C-130J. If you were to go down to the Marietta facility today, you would see um, a new manufacturing line that's been laid out that has significant efficiencies laid into it. And you could see the one area where they haven't finished laying it out 
and it's the difference between night and day. Those are the types of lean aircraft initiatives that we're laying into all of our programs within the Defense Department, whether it is F-22, JSF, and even our satellite programs. Let me broaden this out for a second. The Congressional Research Service estimates that executing all three of the current aircraft development programs uh, could generate a projected cost of $350 billion. Are you telling us that you think the Pentagon can afford that kind of spending? What I'm telling you, sir, is what I showed you in my sand chart. Uh, we have carefully laid out a program of modernization that lives within the total obligation authority that we have uh, seen and that we are actually below that total obligation authority within the aircraft uh, arena when you look at it from historical terms. Well, let me just give you an example. Back in March of this year, uh, the Air Force's General Joseph Ralston was quoted as saying that one of those three planes might have to be canceled or the number of each plane reduced by as much as half. Was he wrong? Um, I, I don't think I really am prepared to answer a question like that. I think that would be something that um, I would be happy to go get you for the record. But, um, you know, it, it depends on how he said that and the context in which he said it. Well, it's a pretty wide variance with what you, I think I'm hearing from you today. You seem to be telling us that $350 billion for all three of these is no problem, comes right within your budget, and yet he's telling us that it would cause these serious reductions or cancellations. Well, I'm specifically talking to the F-22 program as well as the Joint Strike Fighter program and our other aircraft programs. And what I have shown you is, is what has historically been there and what is laid out in the President's budget today. And it is very affordable. And it's based on a certain t TOA assumption, which is based on the President's budget. That's what I'm saying to you, sir. Were you familiar with uh, General Ralston's earlier comment? No, I am not. I've been told by some that the Department of Defense is scheduled to meet this month to perform a comparative analysis of the F-22 and some cheaper alternatives. Are you familiar with that, and is, is that meeting still planned? Uh, there has been a study that has been uh, undergoing since, um, I guess, around, what, July, George? Yeah. Uh, July of uh, 1999. Um, I have not yet seen the results of that study, and I will look forward to seeing it, um, I believe, uh, next week when it's presented to Dr. Gansler. Perhaps Dr. Snyder could better address that. Uh, this study is going on. It was asked for by Dr. Gansler uh, as, as part of, uh, if, you, if you will, a, a what-if drill, which we do quite often within the department. Uh, we have uh, great hope that the F-22 program will be carried out within the cost estimates and the, the cost caps. Uh, one has to look at eventualities if that should not come about. What we have done is uh, set forth a study that looks at what might be alternatives should that happen. And we have look, uh, are looking at other aircraft, such as modifications, uh, improvements to the F-15. We are looking at the Joint Strike Fighter. Uh, I have seen some preliminary results from this, and the results uh, show to me pretty strongly that the F-22 has a very important place in the, uh, the future of our tactical aviation program. Getting back to the point that, that Congressman Shays made early on, uh, in terms of that capability, the F-22 is the only show in town, and that's part of our intent to make sure that we don't have a fair fight in the future. Uh, so we believe we are looking at such alternatives, but uh, the analysis that I have looked at thus far indicate that very strongly that uh, we do need the F-22. If you excuse me one second. Well, you're talking about having a fair fight. I mean, I, I think it's 
fairly indisputable at this point in time that uh, there's no fair fight going on between what the United States has for uh, systems and, and what any projected enemy might have. I note that you said there's a rough parity today with the SU-27 and the MiG-29. If you upgraded the F-15, that would certainly uh, put a stronger imbalance between any rough parity, would it not? Uh, there's only so much you can do with the F-15. Uh, the thing that the F-22 particularly brings is a very low radar cross-section. That's a tremendous advantage in air-to-air uh, -air as well as uh, protecting you against surface-to-air threats. Uh, the F-15 will never be able to be improved anywhere near the capability of the F-22. And this is the sort of thing that that we feel our forces need to have in order to be able to operate with a great disadvantage or a great advantage on our part. The way things are moving along right now, is it, uh, are you telling me that all of the testing will have been completed before the first uh, production is done, the first models come online? No, sir, we have a, a test program that is laid out through the completion of uh, EMD. The final uh, testing that is done in this uh, aircraft right now, we're in what's called developmental testing. The final testing will occur um, in uh, mid-2002 or 2003, and it's called uh, operational test and evaluation conducted by um, the AFITEC organization within the Air Force. But what I can say to you is, if you looked at the schedule we had back in 1997 and you look at our current schedule today, yes, we have replanned our test program. It has been reviewed with all of our testers. They're the ones that have actually helped us to put it together. Um, we have been able to rephase and, and, and do some things smartly with respect to our test program. Uh, for example, I, I mentioned the climatic labs. We had scheduled that the airplane, one of our test airplanes, would have gone in there on two different occasions. <coughs> and we were able to streamline that and get all the testing done, you know, uh, with uh, one visit to the climatic lab instead of two visits. That, that alone, for example, uh, helped us to uh, recapture uh, six months of some um, lost test time. Well, can I just interrupt you there for a second? Are you telling me that all the developmental testing will be done before the first models are produced? No, all of the developmental testing will not be accomplished before the first models are, are produced. Um, <clears throat> so we're ahead of ourselves on that. We're going to be building things before the developmental testing has been done. And as our experience in the past has not shown us that sometimes that's a little over-optimistic and we end up with systems that don't meet the requirements that we had hoped for? If you were to uh, look at um, other programs uh, like the F-18, for example, the F-15, the F-16, you would find when you enter into low-rate initial production, you have not completed all developmental tests. What you would find, though, is that you have completed a sufficient amount of tests that you have confidence that the airplanes that are going to be produced will, in fact, meet the warfighters' needs. So your testimony is we've never run into difficulty before completing the production before we've done the development no, testing? No, I, I would never say we have never run into difficulty in any of our programs. You know, I, I believe it was either F-15 or F-16 that had some problems. F-18 had some problems. But the problems that we have seen to date with the testing that we have done in F-22, including our flight testing, are well within the spectrum of what we expected. The airplane is performing exceedingly well and, and to date meeting all of its requirements. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, we'd um, ask for Mr. Micah. What we're doing is we're, we're doing 10-minute segments. We don't seem to get a red on this thing, but we'll, we'll roll it over twice.
people coming after us or threatening a world stability or regional stability in the world. Uh, the major question before us is uh, trying to contain the costs and the development of this. Dr. Schneider, uh, first of all, um, there have been cost overrun, and it's my, I've been told that it's about a 5% cost overrun. Is that a fair estimate of the total amount, or is it a larger figure we're looking at now, just in a ballpark uh, range? I suspect that if you looked at cost estimates at the time we started development, that you would find a somewhat larger percentage overrun than that uh, at this point. As Mrs. Druyan's chart showed, however, you have to watch out how you define overrun. Um, in some cases, this is caused by bad estimating on our part. We just don't know well enough what to do. We run into difficulties we didn't anticipate. Um, a large part in the development cost increase on the F-22 was uh, inefficiencies caused by having to replan the program. Well, uh, this program, as I understand, started out around 1991. Is that correct? Yes, that is. And uh, if we're going to look at what has caused us to have cost overruns, there are going to be some uh, various uh, areas uh, that have been responsible for driving the cost up. One of, the other, one of the things that concerns me is the way that Congress has sort of jerked this program around, um, and um, Congress has changed uh, uh, both the uh, requirements uh, several times. Is that, is that not correct? Uh, I think we started out with the changes have been less in requirements than in funding. And in the, the course well, we of started out with what? Uh, wasn't it an initial procurement of 700 or something? And where are we now? 300? Oh, um, as far as the numbers to be procured, uh, that has decreased. And we are at uh, 339 at this point. That will affect um, your average unit cost mm -hmm. quite a bit, but should not have an effect on the development cost. Um, with the uh, question of congressional uh, changes in, in uh, funding and commitment to the program, it's also been estimated to me that about 40 percent, 41 percent of some of the cost, increase in cost could be contributed again to the, uh, the uh, congressional instability in supporting the program or uh, changes. Is that a fair estimate? Tell me what you... Uh, I would have to, to give you an answer for the record to be precise on that. Um, my, uh, my guess would be that the part that was caused by congressional changes would be a little bit less than that. There were also some changes, frankly, uh, funding instabilities that the department caused itself. Uh, well, if we looked at, uh, again, congressional responsibility for some of the cost overruns, the management responsibility. Uh, and I, I won't you ask you that because you're, you're really, I guess, in charge of the admin, management or administration. Uh, another Im important factor would be uh, contractor uh, cost overruns. Uh, as a percentage or as a factor in, uh, uh, in the total uh, cost overruns, where does the uh, contractor uh, fit into this? Uh, I think roughly about 50-50. Is that right, Darlene, yeah, in I terms think, of yeah, I, uh, I think the total uh, cost growth? I think it's close to that. If I could try to answer your question, um, Congressman Micah. And I, I want to divide that up because I think the contractor would have certain res uh, responsibility and funding overruns, and that we could probably document. Of course, some of that may be ba uh, based on uh, changes in technical uh, requirements, uh, and that would be the other part of the question. 
uh, both uh, uh, requirements that, and, it, and, and I know it's hard to get uh, a handle on all of these exact figures, but since 1991, we've, we've had great advances in uh, technology. And I, I've also known that all of the federal agencies are prone to uh, change uh, the uh, procurement uh, requirements, as, at least from a technical standpoint, uh, as projects uh, of this nature go along. So maybe you could give us a little bit of information about uh, cost overruns attributed to these two factors. Uh, yes, I'd like to do that. Uh, if I could have uh, my EMD airframe contract cost track back up on the monitor. Uh, what I explained uh, earlier, and I think that um, perhaps uh, you arrived a little bit late at the time, is when you look at the original contract value back in the 1991, early 92 time frame, when we awarded the development contract, it was $10.3 billion. Today, my estimate at completion of the airframe, this is a Lockheed contract, is basically $14.3 billion. What you would see is a difference in $4 billion from my original value to where I am today. Uh, and when I break that down, I broke it down into what I term three buckets. One was called rephasing the program. And these were a combination of congressional cuts, and they added up to $559 million and defense cuts, which added up to $244 million for a grand total of $803 million. And what, what you would find is when you have to rephase a program, you have to stretch it. You have a standing army. You have to keep in place. The program becomes more expensive. So 15 percent of that cost growth that we see is because of the, the instability in funding, whether it was by the Defense Department or the Congress. 15, did you say 15 percent? 15 percent. For Lockheed. And Lockheed's actual cost growth is in the neighborhood of 18.7 percent. And I'd like to put that in its proper context. If I had written a fixed price incentive um, ceiling type contract instead of a cost type contract, and I had set my ceiling at 140 percent or even 135 percent, I would still be under that ceiling today. When you consider the technology that we have uh, developed in this program, um, a very, very complex program, a, a and cost growth in the area of 18 to 19 percent is, is actually a good record. I could point out other programs to you where we have seen much more significant cost growth. If you look at the engine contract, um, it was a smaller contract. Its original value was about $1.5 billion. Today, my estimate to complete that program is about $2.4 billion. And once again, 23 percent of that cost growth we saw was because of program funding instability. Uh, 32 percent of that was um, contractor cost growth. And part of that was a collective decision made on the department's part, and I believe a correct decision. We basically, back in 1994, as a result of testing on the uh, hot uh, section of the uh, turbine, saw potential durability issues. And it's very important you build an engine that's durable and that will have low life cycle costs. And so we decided to go ahead and redesign that portion of the engine to ensure we had long-term durability. And that drove about half of that cost. Uh, and the other bucket that you see over there basically re refers to requirement changes. And I think that's a, it's something I track uh, on an annual basis to um, understand what has exactly happened within this program. Uh, before the defense uh Appropriations Act delayed the decision on uh, low-rate production. That decision was to be, have been made uh, this month, I understand. Uh, in your estimation, would this program have been ready to enter production uh, this month as was originally uh, uh, scheduled? And my answer, sir, is yes, it absolutely was ready to enter into low-rate initial production of um, six airplanes. We have demonstrated super crews. We have conducted weapons bay open testing. Uh, by the end of December, I will have fly 500 flight hours of testing. You saw my previous chart, which laid out the thousands of hours of subsystem and component and subcomponent testing that has taken place to date. 
Uh, we've been able to demonstrate high angle of attack, post-stall flight with thrust vectoring. We've demonstrated flight at 50,000 feet, uh, and we've um, greatly expanded the, the flying envelope of the F-22. The fact remains all of the criteria established in 1998 by Dr. Gansler, uh, we satisfy. Well, I guess finally, do you believe that this program can be executed within the congressionally uh, mandated uh, cost caps? Uh, yes, um, that's something that I track very carefully on a monthly basis um, that I drill down and understand. And our estimate today is when I look at the EMD uh, development cost cap, yes, we have cost pressures, but we have also laid in um, initiatives to ensure that we stay within that cost cap. The service cost estimate um, basically agrees that I can de deliver within that cost cap. And for production, uh, I believe that um, if our target price commitment curves and all of the other production cost reduction initiatives that we have laid in place, uh, we're aggressively managing them, and we believe we can bring this program in under the congressionally imposed uh, cap. And uh, this is something we watch every single month that we report uh, all the way through the senior Air Force management as well as to uh, OSD, and we'll continue to very carefully watch this and understand what is happening within the program. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We're going to go through another round of the members, uh, but w Mr. Chambliss will ask questions, uh, has 10 minutes, and then we'll do another round. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to tell you that I appreciate the opportunity uh, that you've given me to be here today and to participate in this hearing on an issue that I'm very sensitive to and, and frankly, very supportive of, and your uh, reputation of fairness and objectivity is well known to me, so I particularly appreciate uh, your approach to this issue. Um, I would also say that that um, while I do represent the state of Georgia and the F-22 is to be manufactured in Georgia that is not manufactured in my district, nor is there any uh, subcontractor manufacturing for the F-22 in my district. So my interest is not parochial. It's simply one of the fact that as a member of the Armed Services Committee, I have come to know and understand that if we are to maintain air dominance, that the F-22 is a critical weapon system and that it is simply vital to the future national security of the United States. I'd also uh, just like to point out that uh, Ms. Drury and I are very well acquainted as she testifies before my committee on a fairly regular basis, and uh, she has had jurisdiction over the last five years that I've been a member of Congress on any number of issues that I'm very interested in and sensitive to, and she'll be the first one to tell you that we've not always agreed on on issues, but as she knows, I have great respect for her abilities, particularly in the area of acquisition. She's done amazing things in, in the area of acquisition and, and uh, is well regarded and well respected um, in the Department of Defense and certainly before our committee. Mr. Ewing, I just want to uh, confirm a couple of things for the record. You alluded to this in your statement, in your written statement as well as your oral statement earlier. With respect to the need of the F-22, I don't want to go into great detail about it, but uh, there are some general statements that I think are general facts that are, are well known that I think uh, should be brought out today. And you referred to the fact that we have been able to maintain air superiority or air dominance in our last several conflicts. And if we're going to continue to do that, that the F-22 is essential. You also stated that um, the F-15, which has been the vehicle by which we have maintained that air superiority, is now on parity with the Su-27, which is a Russian-made tactical air fighter. Uh, is it not a fair statement that uh, while we're on parity today that the Russians also have uh, ready for production the Su-37? which is going to be far superior to the current F-15 and would even be superior to the F-15 with the modifications that have been alluded to uh, as an upgrade for the F-15. Yes, I believe that's correct, sir. And is it not also generally known that uh, while 
the Cold War may be over, that the economy of Russia is certainly not uh, a booming economy, but one of their biggest sources of income is the sale of military hardware. Yes, that's also correct. I was just there um, during the month of November. And there are other nations out there who manufacture aircraft that also have on the drawing board aircraft that are superior to the current F-15 and superior to the proposed uh, upgraded F-15. That's also correct. Now, we um, uh, have online, and, and Mr. Tierney alluded to this, and it is an excellent area of discussion, and that is the area regarding the collision course we've been headed down from attack air perspective. We, we have the F-A-18 E&F, which is the most modern aircraft that's in the uh, uh, inventory of the Navy. We have the F-22 online. We also have the Joint Strike Fighter, which is still in R&D, but is projected to come on board uh, subsequent to the F-22. The JSF is going to have certain assets that are, are uh, uh, also on the F-22. And is it a fair statement to say that the projected cost of the Joint Strike Fighter depends on our production of the F-22? Um, yes, uh, th that's absolutely correct. When you look at um, avionics, the F-22 will have the most sophisticated avionics system ever in any fighter aircraft. When you look at the F-119 engine, the F-119 core uh, is being used by Joint Strike Fighter. Those are just two areas um, where um, these programs are dependent upon each other, yes. And at the same time, isn't it correct that the F-22 is going to be the first day, first strike, first kill? aircraft as opposed to the F-22 not having the supercruise, not having all of the sophisticated integrated avionics so that the Joint Strike Fighter is not going to have the capabilities of penetrating behind enemy lines to fire that first shot before the enemy ever knows they're there, which is an asset that the F-22 possesses. And, and, and clearly the F-22 is, is there for air dominance, yes. Now, also, uh, Mr. Tierney's question related to the um, expense of all of these tactical aircraft, which is an issue that we have discussed within the Armed Service Committee, uh, Armed Service Committee a number of times, and it's a very legitimate question. Um, but I want to just make very clear today that what you're here talking about is the F-22, which is not going into the inventory of the Navy. It's not going in the inventory of the Marine Corps which the F-18 is in the inventory of both uh, those services, Joint Strike Fighter will be going into the inventory of all three branches. And what you're talking about today and what your charts reflect is the purchase of the F-22 by the Air Force, and we're not discussing the other services today. My charts reflect the purchase of the F-22 aircraft, but my charts also show those um, Conventional takeoff and landing, we call them CTOL variant of, of Joint Strike Fighter. That is also built into our um, presidential palm, and it very much fits within the historical levels that we have seen over the past 30 year period. Okay. You also alluded to the um, per copy cost of the uh, of the F-22, and I want to make sure that everybody understands that when this airplane was originally uh, decided upon several years ago that the uh, schedule was to purchase some 750 plus aircraft. 750. That it was ultimately uh, subsequently reduced to um, about 550 aircraft and then ultimately reduced down to about 339 aircraft, I believe, is the now scheduled purchase. Yes. All of those decreases contributed to an increase per copy cost. Is that a fair statement? Yes, uh, that is correct. As a matter of fact, what I would add to that, um, I've done some unit flyaway cost comparisons using um, base year $99. And today, with a maximum production rate of 36 aircraft a year, we are projecting 84.7 million per aircraft. If I were to put that back up at its original number of 750, with a maximum rate of 48 aircraft a year, uh, it would lower its cost from 84.7 million to 63.4 million. The point is, 
you know, all of these aircrafts are very sensitive to their costs as to the quantity and the rate buy you do per year. And another um, method that we commonly use to lower that cost per copy is the multi-year buy. Is that a fair statement? Yes, that's correct. And do we have some experience to show that uh, the multi-year buy does, in fact, lower that per copy cost? Um, yes, I think the best uh, example I can give the committee today is the C-17 program. Uh, the C-17 program uh, entered into a multi-year procurement with the uh, express approval of Congress, and we were able to take out approximately 5.5 percent of the uh, recurring cost of that airplane. I think it's a very good example of um, what you can do when you have stability, funding stability in a program. And part of uh, the F-22 program, uh, when we reach lot four, is to be able to, and by then we will have completed all operational testing and development testing, uh, is to be able to enter into a multi-year procurement. And our estimate is that we'll be able to achieve at least a 5.5% savings. Mr. Ian, is it a fair statement that uh, the F-22 program, from a cost perspective, is now at a very high profile in the Department of the Air Force? Absolutely, but I would tell you um, that it has been a very high profile for a fair number of years. Uh, I have conducted monthly execution reviews on this program before it ever came under a cost cap. What I have found in my own experience in managing complex programs in terms of my oversight responsibilities is I meet every single month with the contractor and my program management team, and I drill down into, you know, where are we in performing this contract, what is driving the costs, what is uh, driving the schedule, and are we meeting the technical requirements. And I find that when you do this month after month after month, um, you really get a team working and focusing together and understanding what it is that they need to do to be able to bring a program, in this case the F-22, within the cost cap. Did you go through a similar procedure with the C-17 program? Um, yes, I did. Um, and I think the C-17 is a, is a great example of a, of a program that um, turned around because of that. It, it took tremendous focus and effort not only in the Air Force's part, but also on OSD's part. And you are seeing the same type of teamwork today on F-22. And are you comfortable, again, that uh, you're going to be able to meet these caps that have been imposed by Congress on the F-22 program? Uh, from all the data that I have seen to date, yes, I am. Uh, and I have said that, uh, I think, very clearly in my statement as well. And this will be a program that uh, we will continue to monitor on a monthly basis, lay in the right metrics, and ensure that we have the right mechanics in place to be able to turn this into reality. And it's hard work. This is not easy. Mr. Chairman, that's all I have. And again, I thank you for allowing me to participate. I'm having trouble knowing what the benchmark is, and because I have trouble knowing what the benchmark is, it's harder for me to, to um, have a sense of, of quite where we are. And, um, and I think partly, uh, legitimately, the benchmark has changed, and I think in part it may not. It, it, and then I realize there are benchmarks within the overall benchmark. So. Um, uh, I'm just going to make a reference first to the GAO report that was dated March of 1998. And I'm on page 8 of that. Do you have that report? <clears throat> it's, uh, the, it's titled F-22 Aircraft Progress in Achieving Engineering and Manufacturing Development Costs. Um, we're looking to see if we yeah, brought it with okay. us. Take your time. We just time is something we have today. The, the bottom line to this is that 
in, in 1997, do you have that report? Ah, uh, yes, we have found okay, it. Okay, I'll wait, I'll wait, thank you. On page eight, um, in 1997, I'm looking at the chart, table two. Do you have that? Yes, I do. Okay, thank you. Um, in 1997, we passed the 1998 Defense Authorization Act. And it was basically the schedule that came under that. And that was a recognition that we were going to be 1.5 billion over costs. And for a variety of reasons, production levels changing and so on. Um, and this chart points out that we um, were actually from that, that schedule of 1997 um, in the Defense Authorization Act, we were actually 16.9 months behind on testing vehicles. And um, it's entitled Expected First Flight as of January 1998. And I think we refer to that as the Master Schedule 24. Is that correct? Um, no, that was the previous uh, Master Schedule. No, no, not, I'm talking the middle column. That's when you testified. You testified before the Senate Committee, and we were looking at 667 million over on then. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So 1.5. A billion over, over, overrun, and and I'm going to accept there are going to be some overruns. So you know, just because I say the word overrun, I'm not losing sleep about it right yet. But I just want the full picture. Um, so from the first schedule, it's 1.5 billion, and then the second schedule, it's we're looking at 66, 666 mi million, and that really to me becomes um, the target that that we're having to deal with. And it's 16.9 months. And then um, we're looking now at the current <coughs> schedule done in June of 99. And that 16.9 months has become 28.89 months. Is that correct? So we've really got, we've, we, we've gone from the the first one we call the, the Joint Estimating Team Schedule uh, that was basically done in the Defense Authorization. And the, and the Joint Estimating Team anticipated 1.5 billion overrun. Is that correct? Oh, that's what the um, GAO report is uh, laying out, yes. Okay, I mean, well, but, it's, but, but you don't disagree with that part of it. Well, if you, he arrives at his um, 29 point nine months, I believe that's the number, based on the 1997 schedule. What right, which is, the joint, which is the joint estimating team schedule. Yes, that was the uh, best schedule the, that uh, I led the joint estimating team that we put together. Right, but I understand. Everyone is an estimate, and every year we have new estimates. But we got to have some benchmark. And, 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 and that was the benchmark. We were looking at $1.5 billion of overruns. That's correct. And, and, and then, then a, a six months later to a year later, we, we then said, well, basically in March of 99, we were looking at an additional $667 million. maybe all justified. But well, the, and I, that $667 million number was identified by the Air Force and right. pro provided to GAO, um, along with the cost reduction initiatives and the offsets that we set in place back in June of 98. I'm just I looking, I'm just looking for the benchmark. Yes. I'm just, I just want to know what the benchmark is. I, I just don't want us to, to lower the bar or raise the bar. I, I want us to know what the benchmark is. So we went from the joint estimating in 1997, 1.5 billion, and then we went to what I'm told is referred to as the master, master schedule 24. Mm -hmm. Is that a, you're not in your head, but the recorder can't. Yes, it, it, um, okay. we're using, I believe now, master schedule uh, 24. Okay, so, um, and when GAO did its report um, in March of 98, they, they were looking at 16 point, and you, 
the Air Force was looking at, and DOD was looking at 16.9 months at that particular time. Is that correct? Of, of, of if delays. You used, if you use the joint estimating schedule. That's what I'm doing. Yes. OK. And if we use the master plan, then we, what we have no we have no overrun at that point. Then I mean, is, is, what, what's the point you're trying to make to me? I'm trying to understand it. Uh, the point I'm making to you, sir, is that we went through a, a DAB review in 1998. We set a new baseline. Would you baseline. explain? Uh, it's a the anachronism. To, okay, is, we went through a Defense Acquisition Board right. review with Dr. Gansler, the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition. At that point in time, he approved a new baseline, the revised schedules that we laid in right. place. Okay. And, and that's where some of this confusion takes place. I'm not really confused. I'm just trying to understand it. I mean, the difference is that um, I just want to understand what the benchmark is and I want to understand and then how we evaluate what you're doing to that benchmark. Yes. Okay. And what you want me to know is that the joint estimating team's benchmark, the 1.5, we're beyond that point now. So you want me to just discard it and you want me to go to the master um, schedule of 24 and should I use that as the benchmark? Well, I would never want anyone to disregard, you know, reality. We had a $1.5 billion right. cost overrun that we put together under the joint estima estimation team. We also, as part of the joint estimating team, set out some revised schedules. Right. Okay? And if you were to read further on, you would, you would find, I think, a little more confusion in the avionics arena. No, no, I don't. Why do you keep referring to it as confusion? The, 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 it, it's, it, I, it, this is, we're trying to sort out facts. You right. keep saying confusion. I, you know. Well, I think the GAO testimony, uh, I read it, um, I believe, last night, uh, indicates that um, we're not meeting the JET schedule uh, that we had laid out uh, in terms of um, our software avionics program. Mm -hmm. And my point to you that I tried to make earlier is that we are meeting that schedule. In some cases, we are exceeding it. We're doing better by as much as six and a half months. Yep. You, you want to talk about a particular element, avionics. Um, why did you want to jump into that point? Why are you making that point to me now? I'm just trying to establish some basic points. Why, why, why are you jumping into that point? Well, the point I'm trying to make, sir, is that um, when you go back and look at what was baseline in 97 to what was the new baseline that was established in 98, the facts and the data obviously change for very solid reasons. Okay. We have gone back. Yes, his number of 29.9 months is correct. If I look at the uh, 97 baseline he was operating off of. Right. This is a very dynamic program. We have gone back and rebuilt our test schedule with the test community. We have found efficiencies in that test schedule. Right. I gave you an example of a climatic lab. If you looked in the 97 schedule, you would have found I took two different airplanes into the climatic lab at Eglin Air ask, Force Base. Let me Base. understand. You're telling me something you want me to know, which I yes. haven't asked, and I just want to understand why you want me to know this right now. What is your bottom line point? My bottom line point is um, I, I, I think that we frankly, when you talk about the 29.9, you know, fewer flight test months, that we're missing what has happened since, you know, the could GAO I, could I, could I, could I made just, their comment with respect to the June Would you, you just know, humor me a second if, if that's what sure. you want to... Debate that issue after I establish that's the issue. And then, and then let's, and then tell me that. But I, see, I'll be confused if I allow you to just keep doing that because I'm just trying to establish some basic points and then tell me those points are irrelevant, but I want to understand if, they're, if they exist as a point to be discussed. And so what I want to just first establish is that in the Defense Authorization Act of 1998, passed admittedly in 1997, you had, we had the joint estimating team say we're going to be 1.5 billion over and and now we, we're saying, okay, we don't want it to be worse. 
We want to, you know. And there may have been reasons why it's worse, and it may have been no fault of the Air Force. It could have been all Congress's fault. I just want to understand it. When you came before uh, the, the, the Senate in 98, we had a revised estimates, and we were looking at changes in dates, maybe all caused by Congress. And those changes in dates, I want to just understand, are referred to as the Master Schedule uh, 24. And that you're telling me yes. Uh, I believe Master Schedule 24 is what we are operating off of today. Okay. Yes. Okay. But comparing that master schedule to the joint estimating team, we found that we were 16.9 months behind in the opportunity to test the plane before we go into mass production. In other words, this is not an irrelevant it, it, bit of information. It may have be justified, but it's not irrelevant. I mean, is that true? I mean, every month that we can test test this plane before we go into production is an important month to have. Uh, that's, that is correct, sir. Okay. Now, um, what I'm looking at now, and tell me if I'm incorrect on that, uh, is that we are from the baseline of, and we'll subtract the two, from the baseline of the joint estimation of 1997, we are 28.89 uh, months, or basically 29 months behind. If you want me to use the master schedule of um, master schedule 24, I'd basically just take the 16.9 from the 28.9, say, and uh, then I'd have my number that were basically what about 12 months behind that schedule. Is that accurate? It turns out to be about uh, nine months. Okay. Well, we have one, you know, one figure that we're going to have to to look at because when we look at the, um, if I look at the, the the jet estimates, the joint estimating team estimates, to what you're providing us now, we come up with 28.89 <coughs> months, and then we. And if you don't want me to use that baseline, I'll subtract the 16.9 from that, and I get, I get basically a number. But whatever you say, 9, uh, your estimate is 9, we'll clarify that, 12. B bottom line, we are going to use as the benchmark the master plan. Uh, we're going to use the um, master schedule 24 as the baseline. Is, is that correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. If you... Um, um, would you look at uh, under um, the F-22 production cost plan, this one here, uh, I, they're not numbered. I, I wrote, it's the 11th on our page, I have my staff just number it, but it's uh, F-22 production cost reduction plan, PCRP savings. Yes, I have two charts, one for um, Lockheed and one for um, Pratt & Whitney. I have the F-22. What, what's the chart you showed? Okay, the one is titled F-22 Production Cost Reduction Plan Savings. Yes, yes, let's put that one on. Okay, and, and that refers to Lockheed Martin's program for the okay. airframe. Oh, it's the airframe, okay. Yes. Now, um, Let me just, since you, you introduced that, just ask you, there, there, how many major, uh, there's the engine, the, the, uh, you have um, Pratt & Whitney, um, who, who, the other participants in the construction of this aircraft, the major <coughs> participants would be who? We have uh, two development contracts, one for the airframe, Lockheed Martin right. is the prime contractor, Boeing is a major subcontractor uh, for the that builds part of the airplane. And then we have an engine contract with Pratt & Whitney. Those are the two major development And who, who's contracts. doing the avionics, or is it many that are doing the avionics? Uh, the avionics is under the uh, Lockheed Martin contract. Uh, Boeing has lead for much of the uh, avionics under that contract. Would you, would you, would you just uh, explain to me, 
of the airframe and the engine, who is uh, at this point able to stay within production costs and meet the time, uh, time frame? Is, is there, can you compare the two? If I look at the um, production cost reduction initiatives that have been laid in place by Lockheed, in July of 99, this chart shows you that I was looking at savings in the range of approximately $16.9 billion. When you go back to the previous chart, the point that I had made was I needed at least $15.1 billion and cost reduction initiatives to stay within the um, cap portion of the uh, production program. And for Pratt, I need $2.5 billion, and to date they have $4.1 uh, billion dollars worth of uh, production initiatives laid in place. We are very actively tracking these. You have to put the two of them together to arrive at the total production cap. Right. Um, I was asking another question. It was kind of a, that's why it might have been hard to follow my train of thought. It was, it was, I was getting distracted a bit, but since you had brought it up, I'm just curious to know, has Pratt & Whitney for the most part kept on schedule? Has it kept on schedule? Is the engine the, uh, the biggest challenge, the least challenge in this, uh, in your whole, um, the engine was a, if I took you back in history, was a challenge back in 1994-95. Uh, since that time, if, if I were to show you the earned value charts that I look at on a monthly basis, their schedule looks good and their costs are, are holding within the spectrum that we had laid out. Okay. Is the avionics the area where we have the greatest uh, delay? If you look and I will go back to the jet schedule that was laid out in June of 97. Um, no, we are actually doing better than what we thought we would do under the original jet schedule in avionics. Okay. We had problems back in 19... The, the wings, for example, um, these were large titanium castings that attached the wings to the aircraft body. We, in fact, had casting problems. We have those problems behind us. We went out and qualified a second source. We now have two sources who are successfully building those uh, large titanium castings. Um, and I think that's where perhaps we tend to get a little bit confused. Back in 97, we did have problems with the wings. We laid a new schedule in place once we were confident and we had proven that we had qualified a second source who, in fact, could help produce these castings. The, 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 whole, the whole purpose of these, uh, the whole purpose of this um, hearing is to not get confused. So you can keep saying confused, 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 but we hope to sort it out. Um, on this uh, chart that we had on 11, which is the F-22 production cost reduction plan savings. Just describe to me what the 16.9 billion means, and then I want to ask you two questions. Okay, the 16.9 billion dollars basically lays out the cost reduction initiatives that we have laid in place uh, since the jet concluded its activities in June of 97. They're broken out with, uh, if I can walk you through some of these areas, um, production um, cost reduction initiatives, that's kind of the blue, green, uh, it's basically producibility improvement projects. Uh, we have uh, diminished manufacturing sources. Um, you have an area that is called lean. This is where you apply lean principles to the factory. Um, we have material efficiencies. This is where I described, instead of just buying material for the F-22, you roll it into all the material that Boeing, for example, or Lockheed would require across the board in their aircraft factories. And you're able to leverage um, much greater uh, pricing with your suppliers, get much better pricing. We have something called PBC, performance-based contracting, 
This is where you take your single performance spec and all the acquisition reform concepts that we have laid into place. Product support, this is where you would rely on contractor logistics support, uh, as well as uh, comprehensive training and, and a much stronger warranty program before we actually begin establishing our depots. We're looking at a multi-year procurement, um, which would start at high rate production. Um, and we're using, looking at using basically about a 5% savings a year. That's what that represents. And then rate savings due to joint strike fighter. Regardless of who wins the joint strike fighter competition, there will be rate savings. And, and that's basically what we have. Is that primarily uh, with the there. engine? Um, yes, that's also yeah. true for the engine as well, for both airframe and engine. Okay. And then the last is the multi-year? The last is the multi-year. Which is? Um, this would be once we have satisfied all the requirements and development, successfully completed it, we would be able to write a multiple year contract like we have for the C-17 to get stability and funding and stability in the production line. And you're able to reduce the average uh, recurring price by approximately 5%. That's what that represents. Now, both, both the multi-year and the joint strike uh, fighter rates are gigantic assumptions, correct? You don't know what the multi-year contracts will be. We don't. Well, if you were to use historical models, sir, 5% so. is um, right in line with those historical models. That would be dependent upon the Congress approving a multi-year procurement. That how, authority how does many? not rest with us. We do, what, I, I, do, I understand that. And I understand you have to make assumptions, believe yes. me. Yes. And I understand that when Congress votes out weapon systems that are greater than our five-year budget allows, Congress decides, and the defense uh, goes along with it, decides to push it to the sixth and seventh year, and we increase costs tremendously. But frankly, that happens because both Congress and defense want these <laughs> weapon systems, and they don't want to see a five-year budget because we'd be over our weapon system. So, you know, it's, it's kind of an agreement that occurs between both Congress and the administration and the Defense Department. Um, would you turn, please, back to the chart that was on the board, avionics software delivery dates? And I'm interested to know why you didn't put the jet schedule in there. You put everybody else's schedule in. Was it just an oversight? I try to um, simplify the chart. I find if you put so much stuff on a chart, but if I could take you back to the jet schedule um, for block um, 2.0, uh, we had uh, projected um, the jet laid out July of 2000. The jet for block 3.0 laid out April of 2001. And for block 3.1, the jet laid out um, September of 2001. So um, if I'm looking at the third block, block 1.1, we're based on the jet schedule would be four months behind? No. No, sir. It's already been delivered. Jan January, actually... January 99? It's need, need date, uh, according to the JET, was uh, June of 11th, 1999. And it was delivered the 28th of May, 1999. How about, so you're saying it's one month ahead? Yes. Okay, on, on block two, uh, three, uh, the one, two, three, four, five, six, seventh block, six block down, uh, what was the schedule on that? Wasn't, didn't the JET say January of 2000? It does, it anticipates it. Are you referring to the block that says sensor physics? Yes. This was a change to the debt, to the JET. This was a, an additional block of software that we added in uh, to put it into the um, avionics integration lab and into the uh, flying test bed. This was a risk reduction 
block that we laid in. <clears throat> Let me put it in my words. Are you saying the jet didn't even have this estimate? Because that's what you I, seem the to be jet, saying. That's correct. Did not have something for a block 2 slash 3S. Okay. Um, with blocks, the last two blocks, do they reflect the delays already that have already occurred? The last two blocks, I assume you're referring to block 3.0 and 3.1? Yes. If, um, taking you back to the jet estimate, the jet schedule, we are ahead of the jet schedule uh, for block 3.0. The jet schedule was April 17th, 2001. Uh, we believe we will deliver that by October 30th, 2000. And the metrics I am tracking show that we're very much on track for that to occur. The block 3.1, the jet said September 2001, um, and we believe that we will be able to deliver it uh, in June of 2001. Uh, which is on or ahead of schedule. Yep, they both would be. Let me just ask you one last uh, chart, and I thank my colleague for his patience. Um, <coughs> if you'd look at chart Air, Air Vehicle op, October 1999 Final CPR. Is this a GAO report, sir? Uh, I'm looking at your report. I'm sorry. This is. I'm. I'm looking page eight. I'm sorry. I. It's not page eight. It's. I just numbered it. Just helpful to have page numbers. You got it on the board up there. Okay. The um, the December number for commitment, which is, uh, commitment, which is the projection, is two twenty five. Um. Your number in October is 222. These are in dollars, 222 million. The cost variation now is 238. So, uh, what what do you think uh, it's going to be in December? I mean, uh, w the bottom line, the number will go up from 238. So we're already going to be above it, from 225 to 238. And the question I have is, is it going to be much higher than 238? I laid out uh, projections through um, really the end of the program. Um, I don't remember what my December projection was, but I expect I will be uh, slightly above it. Some months I'm above it, other months but, I come within uh, ab it. Above 238? Um, Mike, do we know what I laid out for I would have to get you the exact number, but I think it was around 245 million. So it would be um, about 20 over, give or take. Yes. Yeah. Is that significant? Um, no, I don't think it's significant. Part of the bump up that you saw from 227 in September, the real cost variance to October, to 238, that's $11 million. Mm -hmm. The bulk of that is a one time charge because of a bonus that Boeing paid to all of its employees when they wrote a new union agreement. So that's a one-time charge. That's why you see this bump off that occurs like that. What we have typically be, being ex, what we have typically experienced is in a neighborhood of about six million dollar a month um, variance um, from the previous month. Yeah. That you just triggered a question, and then I yield the floor to my colleague. I, I make an assumption that estimates um, are allowed to vary by uh, the cost of living. So as, as, the, as cost of living goes up, we, we can change estimates. Uh, how does it work with, what is the incentive to Boeing to control costs if they can basically pass on the cost to you and me and, and everyone else? Well, that's, a, that's a very good question. If I could try to explain how we do um, inflation estimates on this program. Actually, we do it in all defense programs. We have our own inflation rate that we use in building our budget. Um, it's passed down to us, uh, I believe, from the Office of Management and Budget. The inflation rate that we have basically built into this budget um, is less than, um, I believe it's less than 1%. Um, so when we put together the estimate, um, we had to use Department of Defense um, inflation rates. 
Now, if you look at the, this is an interesting anomaly. When you look at the DRI, this is the data resource um, organization that captures all the labor statistics. For this type of work, typically the inflation rate that you see with your workers, they get an average of 3 to 4 percent um, <coughs> increase per year. The way we have to price it out, I basically have to price it out at less than 1 percent a year. Um, and this is why it is, uh, and we track very carefully the recent agreements that Boeing has struck up, that Lockheed has struck up, that all of their major subs have entered into, and they're very much in line with the Data Resources Institute percentage. And this has been a, this is a challenge to, to us on this program, and that's why these cost reduction initiatives are so important, because these cost in reduction initiatives have to offset the difference between the standard inflation rate versus the inflation rate that we use. Um, just let me ask that question, uh, part of the question, and you answered part of it, but um, if Boeing ends up passing on, um, uh, agreeing with its employees to, to give them a bonus or salary increases, um, they're pretty much, we're pretty much locked into Boeing right now. Um, so do we just absorb that cost? Well, in a cost type contract, you do. Okay. EMD, our development contract, is a cost type contract. Now, when I look at my PRTV contract uh, number one and my PRTV contract number two, those are firm fixed price contracts. I do not absorb those costs. The contractor absorbs those costs. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, my friend. You have the floor as long as you may want. Well, I won't want it that long. Uh, can you just repeat for me again what the cost per F-22 is anticipated to be at this time? Uh, the, our estimate today of the average unit flyaway cost is $84.7 million apiece. And as of this time, how, what are the number of uh, F-22s that the Air Force is committed to procure? Committed to procure. Okay. Um, our development program, we're receiving nine air vehicles and two ground test vehicles. The first uh, production readiness test vehicle contract, two vehicles, and the second production readiness test vehicle contract, six vehicles. So it's eight and nine. It's a total of 17 vehicles. Nine plus two plus two plus six, right? Right. Uh, I really don't count the ground test vehicles as air vehicles. Okay. So you have 17 vehicles that are committed for right now. And how many, uh, what is the Air Force commitment to procure long lead materials for how many more F-22s? We have a DAB uh, review, a DAE review scheduled, um, as Dr. Snyder mentioned, this Thursday, the day after tomorrow. And uh, we will review the status of the program. And we have been um, authorized by the Congress to obligate $277 million of procurement funding for a long lead of 10 aircraft for next year. So the answer is 10. Yeah, 10 aircraft, 277 million long lead. So we planned originally for what, 4,337 hours of uh, flight tests overall for this project? I don't recall, sir. I'd have to get that for the record. That sound about right to you? Yes, that's, that's about right. And what percentage of that planned flight testing will we have uh, completed when all this production is taking place for these 17 plus 10? Okay, by the end of this month, uh, I expect we will have 500 flight hours, flight test hours. So by the end of December 2000, it will be over 1,000 flight test hours. Given the complexity of this system, are you comfortable uh, that that is a sufficient testing prior to production? 
Uh, yes, I am, particularly given the test philosophy we laid into this program at its inception, um, testing at the lowest component and working your way up to the system level, extensive modeling and simulation. Um, and if you were to compare this airplane today with respect to an F-15, an F-16, or an F-18, we actually today have more flight test hours than they did when they entered into low-rate initial production. Uh, earlier, you and Mr. Chambliss were having a nice little discussion back and forth, and uh, you mentioned the dependency of the uh, Joint Strike Fighter and the F-22, and you mentioned it again on your production cost reduction plan savings chart. Uh, under the orange square, we had JSF rates. You said there'd be a greater savings uh, in both the airframe and the engine. Can you explain that a little more for me? The um, decision was made when we began the Joint Strike Fighter program to use the same core engine that we're using on the F-22. And, and as you know, the, the engine is still in development for F-22, but that core engine is what is being used by our two competing contractors with Pratt um, for their designs on Joint Strike Fighter. The avionics system that we have laid in place, as I said, is the most complex avionics system in any fighter aircraft uh, manufactured to date. Um, when it's all said and done, my avionics system will have about 2 million, 2.2 million lines of code. Uh, the Joint Strike Fighter is looking at, um, you know, obviously an even more complex avionics system, uh, and theirs could be perhaps double that amount. It depends on the individual contractor's design. But <coughs> to being able to do things like uh, full sensor fusion will be the first time ever we will have demonstrated this on the F-22, and it will be a key part of what they will be doing in Joint Strike Fighter. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm wondering where this, this would be true whether you were moving directly to the JSF and just doing all of this research and development for that alone and, and not producing the F-22, right? Well, I guess my point is the work that we're doing today in development, proving out that you can do this complex sensor fusion uh, and that you can take the core engine that we have developed in F-22 is a great risk mitigator for the Joint Strike Fighter program. So, so all, all the risk goes into the F-22, but if you went straight to the JSF, it would go into the JSF, right? No. Um, I think very clearly the two programs complement each other in terms of the warfighter's needs. Well, that may be the case, but in terms of production and the cost, if you were going to go directly to the JSF, you would just do all of the research and development for the avi avionics and for the engine or whatever directly for that jet, right? That's correct. So the, the savings come only because you decide to, to double up. You're going to use the same for the F-22, you're going to use the same for the JSF, and you're going to have larger numbers, and you're going to spread the cost over that. But if you didn't have the production of, J, of the F-22, then obviously you'd save all of that, and then you'd be moving right to the, uh, the JSF. No, I think you'd have a more complex development program with the Joint Strike Fighter. Somewhat, sure. Yes. But other than that, basically on point. Yes, it just adds to the complexity and to the risk. Just, uh, Dr. Schneider, we talked a little bit earlier about um, the F-15 Eagle and upgrading it or not upgrading it. What upgrades on the F-15 Eagle could reasonably be contemplated? Uh, if you were going to upgrade it, you... Um Probably one of the first things you would do is, is give it an improved radar. Um, you would also do some things to upgrade other aspects of the avionics. Uh, you might do some things, if you could, to uh, reduce its observability. If you did all of those improvements, all, the, all those upgrades on that, how would it compare to what your projections are for the F-22 in terms of maneuverability? Uh, 
uh, maneuverability, I suspect, um, would not be much, I don't, I don't think it would be much different in terms of maneuverability. The thing you would not have, though, in the case of the improved F-15, is anywhere near a small a radar cross-section. So the stealth. You would also not have the ability to fly supersonically without using afterburner. And the big advantage of that is if you have to use afterburner to go supersonically, your fuel flow is extremely high, and so you can only do that for a very short amount of time. What the F-22 allows you to do is to use supersonic flight for a longer period of time because it uses far less fuel than you would need to with afterburner. Is it projected that the JSF will have those capabilities? Well, the JSF uh, will have a lower radar cross-section. It will have, uh, we expect, an excellent avionics suite. Uh, we do not expect that it will uh, have the super, so-called super cruise capability. So it would not, and, and that's one of the reasons that it does not do nearly as well in an air-to-air -air role. And in the view of uh, the Department of Defense, is it not possible to give it that super cruise capability? I don't think it would be possible to do it and still keep within the cost targets which we have for the Joint Strike Fighter. The Joint Strike Fighter, we expect to build a very large number of them. We need them to replace aging aircraft in the Air Force, in the Navy, in the Marine Corps. Uh, since we'll be building very large numbers, it's very important that we keep the cost down. And so we give it only the requirements that it needs to do its principally air-to-surface role. Uh, that does not include supersonic flight uh, without afterburner. Well, if you had a savings in the F-22, a production of the F-22, would it not make it more reasonable to then adjust the cost of the uh, JSF and maybe include some other things that might be a little more costly? Uh, I think the savings we're talking about in the F-22 that Mrs. Gruyan was, was referring to were savings that we need to accomplish in order to buy the aircraft. But the savings I'm talking about, just hypothetically, if we skipped over the F-22 uh, and went to the JSF, you have substantial savings from the uh, from the F-22, and that might not be reasonable to do some other things with the JSF. Uh, you would have some amount of money left. The development program, though, on the F-22 is uh, getting close to complete. Right. Well, when you say you have some money left, you'd have a lot of money left, right? Uh, you would have a lot of money left, but if you then take that money and divide it by 3,000 aircraft, uh, you would find you wouldn't want the cost of the aircraft to go up very much. Uh, so I think you would uh, be very disinclined to give a lot of that additional capability to the Joint Strike Fighter. What countries do you think right now are, are going to have anything even close to comparable uh, with the F-15, as you've talked about, it might be modified or upgraded? Uh, I think the, the uh, Russian aircraft that were referred to earlier certainly fall in that category. Uh, aircraft. Ones that exist or the ones that are on the board? Uh, I believe they exist. The Su-27 uh, does exist. Well, uh, I think a rough other... parity with the existing F-15, but not with an upgraded F-15, right? Uh, I think I think parity is a rough term here. Uh, the thing we're talking about in the F-22 is something that is a large step difference. Yeah, but well, I'm talking about an up possibly I think upgraded F-15. You would still expect to have rough parity among the F-15 class of fighter and the fighters that you would expect to have uh, from other countries. And maybe I'm not being clear, maybe I'm, I'm not hearing you correctly, whatever. 
you have the so-called rough parity, according to our, the report we were given this morning, rough parity between the SU and the MIG and the F-15 as it exists now. Yes. Right? If you were to upgrade the F-15 Eagle to some of the points that you made just a few moments ago, then do you f see anything that exists now that even is close or rough parity with it? Well, I would expect if we would improve our aircraft, others will improve their aircraft as well. I think in any event, we will not have the degree of superiority that we need to have in order to have air dominance, even with the improved F-15. You, you don't think that we had air dominance in the last conflict that we had? I think we did, yes. I don't have any further questions. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. I don't have many more, but I have a few. Um, the F-22, the EMD costs, that's, um, it's number six, page number six on mine. Would you identify the government management reserve number? That's, that seems to be a new number for us. We, we, we're not used to that number. You have it. You have the chart. It's it's. Um, take your time. I realize it's 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 what you were going through, I believe, and what you showed us. We wanted you to go through all your charts sure. without our interrupting you, but yes. we wanted to make reference to them now. We appreciate uh, sincerely the the information you're providing. It helps us ask our questions. Uh, what is the cost management reserve? Uh, that's a that's a number of a, it's 1.3 billion uh, or 130 million. That's a new number for us. We're, we're, we we are we are just being exposed to that. Uh, when I um, testified at the SASC Tech Air hearing on the 17th of March, uh, I showed the figure 666 million. Right. What you see here in the March 99. Yeah, that's the overall chart. That was the overall. That was yes. Yeah, so I, I wanted to. And, that's, and that number is based since the joint es estimating team, that 667. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, okay. The $130 million management reserve I alluded to at my hearing uh, back in, in March. And what we have done, because the Congress has capped this program, and, uh, and development in particular, normally I have to tax all of my programs for small business innovative re uh, research taxes. They're across the board taxes that you have to do. Whenever we cap a program in development, we exempt it from having to pay out those costs. And that has generated another $130 million worth of management reserve for our program manager to use uh, as we complete the development program. When you say alluded to, that's a dangerous word. What does that mean? I did not come out and state what the exact number was, uh, because at the time um, there were a number of contractors. Um, both of my contractors, Lockheed and Pratt, were sitting in the audience. And um, I did not feel it was appropriate at that time to um, openly speak to it. Uh, I made reference to the fact that we had additional government management reserve. Now, does that's that, what I'm showing, sir. Okay, that, so that's not a savings. That's just a, basically uh, a way to meet, meet the cost. It's an added fund that you can draw on. Right, because the, the Congress capped this program. Whenever you cap a program, right. you know, it does not make good management sense to us to tap into that to pay some of the uh, taxes that are required on an annual basis. I'm doing the same thing right now in the Joint Strike Fighter program as well. Okay. Um, would you just, um, I'm just trying to th think of the impact. I, I just want to make sure I understand it. And bottom line, it's a reserve that you can tap into. So you're not making a safe, and I'm not saying you should. I'm just trying to understand it. Yes. You are not making a savings in the program, an offset in the program. You're drawing on a reserve to help meet, meet your numbers. That's correct, okay. to offset the worst case cost growth that I identified okay. back in March of 99. Thank you. Um, when I look at ex 
uh, external stores deferral. Um, deferral means you didn't save, but you postponed. That's still in that chart there. Yes, that's correct. It's 140 million. Yes. Um, so the answer to the question is yes to, to my, my question. <laughs> so it's 140 million that we're going to occur, but we're going to occur later. When we put together the uh, joint Outs outside the caps, and I'm not saying Congress yes, that's doesn't correct. do it. That's correct, and that was a decision that we made with Air Combat Command. So we're going to have to come up with that money some way, s sometime. It's laid into the program. We always do what's called follow-on test and evaluation, uh, and and these airplanes will continually go through additional testing as long as we have them in inventory. What we agreed we would do... And this primarily was weapon systems? Pardon me? Does this include the deferral of the weapons? The, the No, it does not include the deferral of weapons. It, it only includes, uh, excludes... Let me tell you what we're doing as part of the development program so you can understand it. Uh, we're going to certify the full compliance of weapon systems um, AMRAMs, AIM-9X, um, you know, our gun, the 1,000-pound JDAM, which is all internal carriage, um, which you need so you can have stealth performance. You hang that stuff on the outside of the airplane, you don't have stealth performance. Right. Um, and this represents the go-to-war scenario configuration that our warfighters will take with the F-22. And so as part of the development program, we're going to certify the full stealth combat configuration and the basic ferry config configuration. What we're going to postpone and do as part of follow-on test and evaluation, because we would never take this airplane to war that way, is the external carriage of AMRAMs or JDAMs, basically the ex external carriage of additional um, munitions or missiles that you would carry. And that, that has that been, won't be stealth. That that's correct. As soon as you hang that in the bottom of the airplane, okay. it's no longer stealth. Yeah. Um, so let me be clear. Uh, so what comprises the external stores <laughs> deferral? The cost to go through the full op test certification is 140 million dollars, and that's what we have deferred okay. to follow on test and evaluation. But it wasn't included in the original AMD estimates, originally? Um, I believe it was. Okay. okay. Um, is there any other deferrals that, that uh, show up somewhere in, in, in any of these other numbers, or, uh, or deferrals only in this number of 140? No, to the best of my um, recollection, it's only in this number. Okay. Let me... Um, just conclude with, with an observation, and, and I'm happy to have you make a response to it. Uh, you use a per plane cost, per copy cost of 84 million. If we used all the, uh, all the uh, research and development, we would come up with 184 million. Make your argument as to why we should look at 84 million and not 184 million. We have always uh, reported um the average unit flyaway cost um, with respect to um, all of our, our aircraft. I would tell you every single year when we brief the House Appropriations Committee and have hearings, I basically show three sets of numbers. Would you pull up my backup chart? Um, do I have that chart? I believe you do. Is, is it, part, it was part of this one? Yes, it should have been. Do we include backups? No, we don't have it. I can't read it there, so if someone could give us a chart. Do you have any other backup charts you want to show us? <laughs> they may be the most interesting. Uh, no, I, I, no I, I had a couple of other backup charts, but um, I don't think you would find them to be as interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can um, just bring this over here, Jason. But what we basically do on an, uh, on an annual basis is to report the flyaway cost, the unit procurement cost, and the program acquisition unit cost. We show that in fiscal year $99 as well as then year dollars. So, um, and, we, and we give that every single year to the 
Thank appropriations you. and authorization so, committees. So the program acquisition unit cost would be the entire cost of everything divided by the number of, of planes. Yes, and, and, and it includes okay. your RDT&E and mm -hmm. your military construction, anything that was ever spent with respect to the F-22 program. But a true um, measure of, of a program is really its flyaway costs. Uh, this is the actual uh, recurring costs and non-recurring startup charges to actually build an airplane. Thank you. Do you have any comment you want to make before I close up? Well, uh, I thank you, and uh, I would invite either, uh, uh, each of you to respond to any question we didn't ask that you wanted to answer, uh, or any other comment you want to make. I had nothing more. No, I have nothing more. Thank you, thank sir. You. Okay. Thank you both very much. I really appreciate both of you being here and your testimony. And I'd also like to thank our court reporters. We had two, Ryan Jackson and Bill Odom. And are you Bill or are you Orion? Bill, okay. Now you have to put that down that you responded. <laughs> and um, on loan uh, to us, uh, Major Mike Mueller, uh, who was assisting us in the charts, and I thank you for doing that. And I thank you for having the charts, very helpful. And uh, Don uh, uh, Springman, uh, who's the senior evaluator GAO, he was helpful too, and I thank him. So uh, all of you have a beautiful day. Uh, Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year, Happy Hanukkah, and uh, a lovely day today. Thank you. Thursday's Democratic National Committee fundraiser with President Clinton and Vice President Gore. Washington Journal follows at 8.30.